Hello and welcome to the Wire Talks. I'm Siddharth Bhatia. On October 17th, Shehant Karunathilaka's novel The Seven Moons of Mali Almeida won the Booker Prize for Literature, making him only the second Sri Lankan to get the prestigious award after Michael Ondaatje. Shehant's first novel, China Man, The Legend of Pradeep Matthew, had won the Commonwealth Prize and many other awards in 2010. Shehan has been a copywriter, rock musician, and novelist. He has written for various international papers and is currently working on his next novel and also on children's books. He's written a children's book called Please Don't Put That Thing in Your Mouth and then published a small novel, Chats with the Dead, which was expanded and published as The Seven Moons. The war is very prominent in the Seven Moons of Mali Almeida, but even in China Man, his first book, there is the war somewhere in the background. The author joins us today as our guest, Shehan Karuna Tilaka. Welcome to the Wire Talks. Thank you, Siddha. Pleasure to be here. Firstly, congratulations on the Booker Award, Booker Prize. Thank you very much. This is stupendous. As a fellow South Asian, I can take vicarious pleasure, reflected glory on you winning this award in Britain. But I just wanted to ask, you self-published your first novel, which went on to win prizes. Now, 12 years later, you win the Booker. Does the Booker change things for you? Well, I, I expect it will. I, uh, As you say, 12 years sitting in Karambo, writing these strange books about left arm spinners and ghosts. Um, you know, you, you, you do your best and you expect it will be published in India, in the Indian subcontinent. And in your dreams, you think, okay, maybe I can publish this in the UK and the US. That's the extent of it. And uh, it's it's no guarantee. I mean, my first book managed to be published around the world. Uh, but, you know, with my second, with this Seven Moons, uh, I did struggle to find a publisher. So you can't take anything for granted. So I was grateful to have the book coming out in the UK. And then came along the Booker long list in the midst of petrol queues and uh, public protests, we got this good news. So, um, yeah, I was great. Obviously, you'll be grateful for that. And then when it gets shortlisted, you're quite happy with that. Book a shortlist, who won't say no to that? And so, yeah, now I didn't expect my name to be called out. It's a one in six chance and they're all quality books at this level. And um, so, yeah, now that it's been called out, it's been a whirlwind couple of weeks. I'm, I'm only just coming up for air after all these interviews and appearances and, and so on. Uh, but yes, I suspect I, I won't have much trouble publishing my next book. I, I suspect or, or applying for a visa. <laughs> so, yeah, I think. It, it <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure about the latter because <laughs> you know how these things work. But uh, yes, you won't have to struggle for a publisher. Presume there'll be queues outside and the advances will be sizable. But I remember when I read The Chinaman the first time, I was just simply moved by it. I'm going to refer to it uh, a little later in our discussion why I was moved by it. But before that, my question is, you, you took 10 to 12 years between two wonderful novels. Is it because daily life comes in the way or do you really take a lot of pains over your books? No, so I would ideally like to uh, produce a novel every two years or every year like Stephen King or Lee Child, you know. <laughs> but well, I mean, my excuse is life got in the way, you know, in the sense I got married, I had two children, moved country twice. So there are all those excuses. But also I think when you write your first novel, you're not thinking of a second or a third. You don't think you're going to have a career as a writer. You write your first novel and you hope you will find a publisher. And uh, yeah, once it got published, suddenly the question comes, what's your next trick? And I hadn't really thought about it. So I think it took a while for me to figure out what this, and I, I was adamant, I, I was a bit tired of talking about cricket because I'm by no means an expert and there's plenty of experts in the subcontinent. And um, I wanted to write something different and I thought I wanted to write a ghost story. But yeah, life got in the way, certainly. But also it was a very complex story about uh, a very complex time in Sri Lanka's history. So yes, it, it, it took some time. But I, I, I would like the third novel to appear in a couple of years. I, I, I don't think yeah, a novel every decade is a good business plan. But, you know, it took as long as it took and uh, many multiple revisions. And uh, 
it was published in the subcontinent and then it went through more revisions. But, you know, I, I just think along the way, it became a better and better book. So that's why I, w- I was patient with it. I mean, you did uh, write it as Chats of the Dead and then rework it and made it a bigger, bigger, bigger book. Uh, mm-hmm. And then your editors worked on it and the end result came out a much more at one level complex, at another level uh, more gripping uh, kind of book, at least. I I have quickly read it. I need to reread it slowly. But it begins with the protagonist waking up and suddenly realizing he's dead and uh, looking all around him and slowly the recognition dawns that everyone around him is somebody who's uh, also dead and by various means that's where the hint of the war starts showing up um you know is the death part the waking up from something a dream or whatever and realizing you're dead the ghost is that a allegory a metaphor or it's just a literary device i think certainly a literary device because the the original seed for the novel was was i was i was thinking about this 2010 2011 2012 the the post war period so the sri lanka's 30 year war ended in 2009 and this was unthinkable at the time we we grew up with it we thought this was a forever war we'd been through so many so called ceasefires and peace agreements and new governments promising settlement and the war continued all through my childhood my teen years and and my my young adult life and so it ended in 2009 and it was such a period of hope uh, i remember you know so many sri lankans who were abroad were wanting to come back and invest and start things and and you know now now we're talking from 2022 and uh, you know we, we see where sri lanka is now but i remember that time in 2011 i was quite disappointed that we were arguing we were still we hadn't didn't seem to have learned anything and the debate at that time was the final phase of the war um the figure now is 40000 civilians were killed in that final phase of the war and there was just a lot of laying blame on the other side everyone was arguing whose fault it was it was the ltt's fault it was the government's fault and i just thought if the dead could speak if we could let the victims of sri lanka's war speak because obviously the living are going to rewrite this narrative and uh, we're not going to learn any lessons from it so that was really where i started from the idea that what if Sri Lanka's victims of our many wars could speak? But I wasn't very comfortable writing about 2009. One, because it was recent history and we're still making sense of it. Also, it may have not have been the safest thing to do in that climate to talk about because this was a, a controversial, debated topic. But I sadly, there were many periods in Sri Lanka's history that I could go back to. And I chose 1989 because I remember that time being particularly grim where there were almost three conflicts being fought at the same time. And so I thought, let's just transport this idea to then. And, and the same, and I researched uh, victims of, of um, that, that period, unsolved murders. And I, I just, there were far too many ghosts for me to choose from. Um, so I don't know I, whether it's allegory. I think it's quite literal, the, the idea of should Sri Lanka dig up its past? Should we dig up the horrors of our past and face them and be candid and honest about them and learn some lessons from them, which does not seem to be the favored approach in Sri Lanka. We tend to forget things. We tend to, my example is the Easter attacks, which was not that long ago, 2019. There were many narratives around that, many conspiracy theories and yet there were investigations launched, but you know that's that's now almost history forgotten because we are focusing on 2022. And that seems to be Sri Lanka's approach. We have all these catastrophes and we just tell ourselves we are resilient and we can and we just sort of forget things and move on. And I think so, if there was an allegory, I think that's the central theme running through the seven moons is uh, Mali has to deal with that himself. In his seven moons, what does he do? Does he forget everything, let it be in the past and move on, or does he address them? And I think this was a central theme that I explored in the novel and in the story of Mali himself. So is he reminding people of um, a conscious conscience that's dead, but uh, should not be dead and ask itself things? I'm, uh, I'm, no, I'm no literary critic, but I'm just kind of reader as a reader or uh, no, no, you're a reader, interest. and a reader is the most important. That's the audience you write for, and um, yeah, I I think 
see on a basic level it's a murder mystery so he's he's a war photographer and he's in with all sides all the factions he takes photographs for the tamil tigers for the sri lankan army he strings for the for the british and so he's involved everywhere and, and he has this box under his so one thing is many people may have wanted him dead so that's the basic engine that drives the plot but also he has this box under his bed of photographs that no one seen of atrocities around sri lanka and this was it's something that always bothered me that there's very there, there is photographic evidence footage of our war years but really not I and mean, if you take 83 for instance the the pogroms against the tamil people which many many site as the beginning of the full scale conflict there are about three or four pictures that we see every july that are commemorated on the internet but the the, the atrocities were again there's no official count but thousands of people died and i just had this idea that i'm sure there were people with cameras walking around and what happened to all this because when it goes into the past it becomes history and i feel photographic evidence keeps keeps things alive and so this was the conceit that he he had these photographs that he thought can change everything and so that's the thing that drives the plot but yeah i uh, i'm i'm forgetting the question because i'm rambling so much but i believe mali was that was his purpose to document these things because he felt people in kalambo and the rest of the world aren't aware of the sri lankan tragedy and perhaps if they were aware through photographic evidence these things would stop it's quite a naive wish that fuels it but that was really the the backbone of the of the story is it uh, possible at all to write about sri lanka and uh, not write about the war i mean i ought to rephrase that is it not at all possible to ignore the war if you are a person who writes wants to write about contemporary sri lanka because you do know that a lot of books that came out of the subcontinent were all about the exotica which was selling you know uh, cinnamon gardens and papayas and pineapples and guavas and things like that nothing wrong with them but i'm saying that you have confronted in a sense through a literary through literary means reality that you are saying many of your fellow citizens tend to forget and move on politicians would naturally like to forget except for their own manipulation and uh, if writers themselves forget it then where are we so have there been good writing coming out of sri lanka my question is twofold one is it possible to ignore it two has there been good writing in singala in tamil about these years so that was my brief to myself for the first book chinaman the legend of pradeep matthew was can i write a book um that talks about sri lanka in the 90s that does not mention the war and that was my challenge because i was also reading and there's been a lot of great writing came out of the, of the 90s and to this day so the 90s the so my gurus were so michael ondachi romesh kunasekara she uh, she i'm both were shortlisted and ondachi won the booker prize um shyam selvadure who wrote funny boy which was very ground breaking work for the 90s and karl muller who i've talked about at length not as celebrated as the other three but um, wrote very sri lankan writing but i i noticed a theme a lot of sri lankan writing was yeah it was talking about the war or ethnic conflict and i just thought can is it possible to write a book that doesn't mention that and that's why i chose cricket and arak i chose uh, to tell a story about two old men who just watch cricket and drink arak and the war is happening somewhere else and this was also my colombo experience that i lived during the war and we had assassinations bomb blasts curfews and all that but we were insulated life went on in colombo uh, while the war was being fought a, a bloody brutal war was being fought in jaffna and and in the in the east and so so that was my I, so i think it is possible look sri lanka is not defined by its tragedies sri lanka has many facets to it and it's it is a beautiful island and it's a, a great set for many stories if you're thinking cinematically um so i think yeah it is possible there's plenty of stories in sri lanka that doesn't involve this but having done that after Ch- so china man that was it there's not much politics in china man apart from cricketing politics and and, and so on but then once i finished it yeah this book you're right i i thought okay let's i wanted to write a ghost story because i wanted to get away from cricket 
But uh, yeah, once I got into the ghosts of 1989, there was pre- plenty of politics to talk about. But I would like my next novel, I mean, I can't talk too much c- about it because it hasn't been written, but I would like to return to writing just about, Sri, uh, you know, maybe a comedy about Sri Lanka, about some aspect that doesn't touch the war. So yeah, I think it is possible to write Sri Lanka is multifaceted, but uh, yeah, there's plenty of conflicts and if conflict is the soul of literature and writing and uh, storytelling, then Sri Lanka has plenty of those. In terms of, uh, I think, your second part of your question, I sadly, with Singhala and Tamil, I can't answer that question, not with any authority. I can pull some names out, but this has been a lament of mine that Sri Lankan literature is in silos. So we have Sri Lankan literature in English, which I can tell you a lot about. Um, but there's literature in Singhala and Tamil, and we sort of work in silos, unaware of each other. And uh, I, my hope is, with the success of Seven Moons, that we have more. I, I certainly want this book to be translated into Singhala and Tamil, and that we have more translations the other way, so that we we are aware of each other's literature. But yeah, in Sri Lanka at the moment, I, if I'm speaking just of English literature, um, we have a range of voices. So you have Anuk Arun Pragasam, who was shortlisted last year for Passage North. You know, writing about the same war that I'm writing about, but a very different writer from me. Stylistically, he's a very serious, philosophical, more literary writer. And there's, so there's literary stylists like him and Naomi Munavira, who writes in, in the US, I think, tracing a direct tradition from Undachi and Gunasekara. But then you also have our local homegrown guys who are kind of jokers like me, like Ashok Ferry and Andrew Fidel Ferrando, my good friend, who's, uh, I think, the great Sri Lankan cricket writer, who uh, even though Sri Lanka loses, he can mine some comedy out of it. And I, I look, that's the only reason I still follow Sri Lankan cricket is to <laughs> read Andrew. Uh, and But we also have a young generation, Jyutanje, Vijayaratna, Amanda Jayatis, so, who are bypassing the whole publishing industry. and um, they are writing science fiction thrillers and they found publishers um, in, in America and are doing quite well. So that's a spectrum. And this is just a few names. Sri Lankan theater is quite vibrant in terms of satire. And so, look, I'm not surprised. I'm sure 2022 will produce many Petrol Q novels, Aragalia struggle novels. There's, there's, this year alone has plenty of material for writers. For, but I know that there'll be, there'll be more catastrophes. I mean, I hope not. But I know the way Sri Lanka is, we just seem to have plenty of source material for novelists. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, I'm sorry, even despite the fact that these are very difficult, unfortunate circumstances for Sri Lanka, but that remark of yours cannot be but taken with uh, some humor. <laughs> I, again, putting on my reader hat, I had takeaways from my books. I felt while Chinaman had a very cynical protagonist, there's, uh, he sets out to achieve redemption and find Pradeep Matthew. I felt there was a strain of melancholy running through the book. Here, uh, Mali is a photographer, very sure of his work, sardonic, but he's eventually forced to confront some truths about his himself, about his work. So, of course, there are readers and readers and each has a takeaway. But the, I mean, this is a really generalist question. There is an element of humanity, but laced with cynicism. Is cynicism, is uh, humor, is a twisted way of looking at life in general, a cloak that Sri Lankans tend to wear? Or is it just you in your writing? I think it is a Sri Lankan thing, but certainly it's my sensibility as well. Yeah, you're right. Chinaman is a story of a man drinking himself to death. But while he's drinking, he's watching the 96 World Cup and rejoicing in that. And I just feel that's an apt image for Sri Lanka, that there is this joy, but there's this sorrow that underpins things. And people ask me this question. I've been asked this a lot in the last two weeks. Are you hopeful for Sri Lanka's future? And the thing is, look, I've lived through 40 years of this stuff. And uh, I've seen the many false dawns, the many, uh, we vote in a new uh, president and we think, okay, things are going to change. And so, and also I'm, you know, I suppose I'm part of Generation X. You know, we were the cynical slacker generation, unlike the the young now who have a lot more idealism and and hope. Uh, So that is my natural setting. And if you ask me, I mean, I hope, now things have stabilized in Sri Lanka as opposed to the chaos of three months ago. So now there's hope again. People think, okay, now we're going to rebuild. But, you know, I, I've lived too long and I think 
is this is this really the is this what's going to happen or are we going to be in another mess next year uh, but I think you're right also in pinpointing at the center of the novels, both books, there is an element of hope. I don't think they are ultimately, I mean, I don't want to spoil anything with the stories, but I think there is a there is hope at the heart of it. Even Chinaman, certainly this one, there is a, that sense. So I think maybe I do share that with the Aragalaya generation, with the millennials and Gen Zs that they're, because we know this country and we know what it's capable of. Um, and these cricket metaphors are easy to come by. Like uh, during the height of the the power crisis, the petrol crisis, we beat Australia in a T20 and that just uplifted the whole country and went on to win the Asia Cup. And there is this sense that even if we are five wickets down and up against it, we can somehow hammer our way out of it. And this is something to celebrate this optimism of the Sri Lankan spirit. But also, you know, I, I am a bit cynical. I think we should stop making jokes and dancing and actually just get serious and address these problems and reform. But yeah, I do think it's within the Sri Lankan character. There's even when times are grim, there's a lot of jokes and humor and gallows humor. And you can see that just go on Twitter during the heart of the Aragale, and you just see the memes formed in these situations. You realize, yeah, we are good at making jokes at us. But I mean, what else? Otherwise, we're just going to, because if we get angry and grim, we know what Sri Lanka is capable of. We're also capable of great violence. So better to crack a few jokes and keep the peace, I believe. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back to the Wire Talks. Yeah, well, in my many visits to Sri Lanka, I haven't been there for the last few years, but many visits during the worst periods in in Colombo, I must admit, which like any other big city is insulated and the scotch parties continue. But even then, talking to, uh, you know, citizens who are not part of the inner uh, Cinnamon Gardens crowd, if I may call it that, the elite. I felt the distance was there, but to the common citizen, the daily harassment of, you know, bunkers or police stopping you. I mean, I was stopped at several times at the in, at night, so I could well imagine what. To, but, you know, questions, where are you from? Something interesting to say about your country something interesting to say about your country and you know like all journalists i hired a auto driver for the day and he became my source material for larger questions but my point is even that colombo was distant even so it was feeling the ravages of what was happening in many ways the bombing of the bank reserve bank i felt the humor was there to keep spirits alive is that a too much of a general uh, assessment? No, no, I think it's accurate. Now, wh what you're describing sounds like, again, ancient history, the time of checkpoints. We were a city of checkpoints, and then that ended when the war ended. And so now you don't see checkpoints. You're not, police aren't going to stop you. Um, well, not all of you, but um, there is that sense that, look, um, we still are in an economic crisis. Maybe the queues have abated and all that, but inflation is still galloping and uh, your grocery bill is going to double or treble. And uh, yeah, a vast majority of the population are being pushed into poverty and are skipping meals and malnutrition among children. These are real problems, which perhaps don't affect the cinnamon garden crowd, as you, as you say. And I think you know that's not a bad description. Um, and so that gulf is very much there. And um I, I still do fear, even though things have stabilized, that uh, yeah, next year we are really going to feel the, the brunt of kids not being able to go to school and education being disrupted and all these things. But yes, you're like, right. It's not a grim place. It's not a, even in the height of the petrol queues. And um, I participated in a few of those. There were arguments and discussions and uh, and so on but there were also a lot of jokes and people sitting down playing cards playing carom in the petrol queue making jokes about uh, the president and so on so perhaps that is part of our islander character you know we even when on the cricket field we're always grinning and uh, and cracking jokes or so it seems um so may maybe that is our coping mechanism you have witnessed that particular uh, period of the war as a child as a teenager, as a young man, 
in Colombo, far away, but still in the 80s. And you saw, you said you took part in uh, the petrol queues and you saw what was happening. Is there a novel in all that coming up or is it too, too soon? Yeah, so now me, I'm rather slow. Hopefully now my kids are a bit more grown up and better behaved. I might be quicker. But as you can see, I wrote a novel about the 80s and one about the 90s. So by the time I come to 2022, we might be in the 2040s. So I think, yeah, now my next novel I'm writing about the 2000s. So hopefully I can speed things up. But certainly, look, there's a novel in the Easter attacks, many stories. There's a novel in the last phase of the war. There's a novel in, uh, yeah, 2022. I can think of several. There can be a, no a petrol queue novel uh, or play or, or whatever. There can be a novel about the Aragale, a love story. I already saw the memes of a love story happening uh, during the protests. Also, I mean, there's a great play to be written. These are all free ideas. Anyone, please feel free to take them. Being a fly on the wall of the Rajapaksas during this time, I would have loved to have listen to the discussion at the family dinner table while the country was raging. And uh, yeah, these are all, but it may take me 20 years to get to this because I'm still stuck in the 2000s. But please, I think whoever, Sri Lankan or otherwise, someone should write these stories. But um, yeah, there's an abundance of material for novelists. That you can say that much about Sri Lanka. Yeah, well, thank you, Shehan uh, Karna Tilika, for this wonderful not just talking about the book, but talking about Sri Lanka, talking about how uh, the spirit of Sri Lanka, the spirit of Sri Lankans, how they cope. And all we see in uh, newspapers is, of course, people ransacking the presidential palace. Though I must tell you, sitting far away, there was great dark humor in it. It was macabre. No, so let me correct you. The ransacking... Like when I went to the presidential palace, I mean, I, like I said, I'm not an activist. I'm a pacifist. I watch from a safe distance and then I come and observe the thing. And when I was at the presidential palace on July 9th, there were young people run, holding boards in all three languages, Sinhala, Tamil and English saying, come have a look, have a laugh, take a selfie, but please don't break anything. Don't steal anything because we are not thieves. We are not looters. We are good people. We, and this is our money. And that just moved me beyond measure. That, uh, and that was the spirit of the Aragalia that I felt. It was not, you're coming in here to destroy things. It was just, we want responsible people controlling our country and our fate. And that was really the spirit of it. Of course, look, the Aragalia has now been, the narrative is now being changed and they're highlighting the radical elements and the small episodes of violence. But I think predominantly the Aragalia was something... Yeah, we, we came in, we sat on the president's couch, watched his TV, watched the cricket on his TV, jumped in his pool. There was a lot of silliness, but uh, I don't but, think there was malice. Yeah. But, uh, but in any case, you know how the media misrepresents Correct. these things. So that apart, in any case, I felt that there was some something very dark humorish about <laughs> it. That uh, here is a, a country asking for the powerful to give an account of themselves in that sense and saying and mm. shaking this man to run away from the country even if for a few days it was just mm. it was just to me as a sitting far away i thought it was a very very radical spontaneous combustion move so thank you very much as you said no dearth of stories novels plays films art in uh, sri lanka as indians who visit that place i certainly do we wanted to get back sooner than later. So thank you very much in the middle of your 250 <laughs> interviews per day <laughs> that you found time. But uh, look forward to meeting you if whenever you come to Bob India or Bombay, really. Thank you, Srinath. And please come and visit us. I'll show you the new psychedelic bands in, in Sri Lanka. There's a few. And yes, I shall. Please. I, sh I shall. That's, that's going to be uh, this bond and connection. So thank you once yes. again, Shehan. That was Shehan Karana Tilake, author of the, the Seven Moons of Mali Almeida, which has just won the Booker Prize, the prestigious Booker Prize, I may say. And as he said, now he won't have to struggle to find a publisher. I hope my conversations are keeping you updated on what's happening in India and the rest of the world. Along with The Wire, where you can listen to my show, 
You can also listen to it on IBM Networks, Audible, Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, Wink Music, Spotify, and Listen Notes. A wide spectrum of platforms where the Wire Talks plays every week. We'll be back once again next week with another guest. Till then, goodbye from me, Siddharth Bhatia, and the rest of the Wire Talks team. <laughs>